New Year's Eve is always a moment for celebration, and this year even more so as the Euro family gained a new member. Croatia officially adopted the Euro on the 1st of January 2023. As ECB President Christine Lagarde said on her social media channels, completing all the reforms and restructuring needed in the 10 years since joining the EU is an incredible success and reason to celebrate. But changing currency is a massive undertaking, and it's definitely not something that just happens overnight. Today, we're going to look at what goes into a cash changeover, and the things that people, businesses and national authorities have to do to ensure a smooth transition. You're listening to the ECB Podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm joined here by Patricia Roa Tejero, who heads up our currency issue and circulation team here at the ECB. Patricia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Katie. Very happy to be here today. Now, you're from Spain, one of the first countries to adopt the euro back in 2002. Where were you on changeover day? I'm quite curious to hear this because I'm from the UK and we've never experienced a cash changeover like this. So I'm a bit jealous and uh, I'm curious to hear what your experiences were. Do you remember, for example, the first time you held a euro banknote or coin in your hands? Well, 2002 is quite far away, so I don't remember everything that happened on that day. (laughs) Um, But I do remember that there was quite a lot of back and forth on the currency changeover and what it meant for us, um, for us as Spanish people, and a lot of efforts on communication as to how to get used to that and the euro versus the peseta. And the exchange rate for peseta was actually from one euro to 166.386. That was a number that was repeated very often (laughs) and that we obviously all forgot immediately thereafter. (laughs) Um, So after a while, there was a kind of rule of thumb that was uh, communicated, which was six euros being equivalent to thousand pesetas. And this uh, this really stuck with us uh, for a long time. And it was very funny to actually go shopping um, because everybody was sort of trying to remember their maths and how six dividing by six or multiplying by by six should be done. And there were a lot of discussions. So grandmother, grandchildren trying to figure out if the price was right or or not really. So this is the only thing I actually remember from changeover day. Um, everything else, I think we got all settled pretty quickly into the euro and uh, how to pay with it. Okay, maybe it's good that we didn't have a cash changeover in the UK because maths is not my strong point, so I would have struggled with that. Now, I said at the beginning that a changeover is a massive undertaking and there are lots of different aspects that go into it. For example, In the case of Croatia, there were countless legal acts that used to mention the kuna as the official currency, and obviously they needed changing. There were security issues to do with transporting new coins across the country, and uh, I even heard that the military played a role there. And of course, there was so much more. Now, for Croatia's changeover, the government, the National Central Bank, the Hrvatska Narodna Banka, and colleagues from the ECB worked together on all the preparations. Let's talk about the switching of banknotes and coins, so the cash that people really use in their everyday lives. That alone must have been a massive task to prepare. And of course, the euro is a little bit different from other currencies in that euro coins have a different design for each country. So it's not just a case of minting more of the existing coins as you would do in a single country. Let's start with um, banknotes. What kind of steps are involved in producing the cash money there? So like the changeover itself, it's uh, quite a bit big task. So uh, banknote production in the euro area is uh, pooled. So this means that we actually have each national central bank responsible for producing or procuring a part of the total banknote needs of the euro system. It's not the part they exactly need, it's a part they are allocated. So what the national central banks do is they produce or procure these banknotes and then we merge all the stocks into one common pool. And this is where we then pull from when we need banknotes in one country or the other. So this is the same that happened for Croatia. So the banknotes that have been used to facilitate the changeover were taken from the stocks, which we had, the ECB and the national central banks had, and they had to be delivered from these central banks to Croatia and across the country to be ready for changeover date. So 
Croatia has around 4 million inhabitants and it's also often referred to as a land of thousand islands. So with <laughs> this, I think you can get a feel for the efforts that had to go into getting these banknotes to the right place. I think we need to acknowledge the very good work that has been done by the Croatian colleagues in making sure that all this happened uh, before 1st of January. And uh, just for you to imagine, it's not we're not over yet. Now we need to withdraw, or they need to withdraw, 500 million pieces of Kuna banknotes. And uh, just to give you a feeling, if we would pile them up or stack them one on top of each other, it would mean almost six times the height of Mount Everest. So it's quite a big deal that is still in front of us. Okay, I'm starting to get an idea of just how big it was. And indeed, as I said at the beginning, it's not something that just happened overnight. You know, there was a huge process ahead of 1st of January. And indeed, as you just said, there's a huge process afterwards as well. Now, let's talk about the coins. That was the banknotes. How about the coins? How does it work for those? So coins is a little bit different. Um, while banknotes look all the same across the euro area, euro coins do not. Mm -hmm. um, this means they have a common side, but they also have a national one. So you need to decide as a country what you want to show there and what could best represent your country. So this process of uh, creative uh, thinking and choosing the symbols that you want to use uh, was also carried out in Croatia before the changeover date. It involves consulting the general public, but also experts, so it takes quite a while. And the artists then present their designs. And that's not the end. So once you have the design there, you need to move into production. And the Croatian National Bank needed to make sure that coins were produced well in advance so as to be ready for 1st of Jan. The National Central Bank, in addition to producing, also um, bought coins from two other member states and also borrowed coins from another one. So this means that on 1st of January, not all euro coins in circulation in Croatia were actually Croatian design, but you also had designs from other member states that came in to support. In order to make sure that there were enough coins to go around on the 1st of Jan. That's it. Mm. That was an additional help also to the Croatians to make sure that we had enough volume on the right date. Yeah. And also as regards coins, we also have to still withdraw, or they would also have to still withdraw more than 1.1 billion pieces of coins, kuna. So this means that, just to give you also a feel here, this would mean filling a football field up to half a meter of height. So this wow. is also still a task coming up. <laughs> okay, so obviously the official changeover day was the 1st of January, as we've mentioned a couple of times. But in fact, banks, the Croatian post office and also the Croatian agency that provides financial and electronic services, that's called FINA, they received euro cash in advance, right? Correct. So this is called front loading. We call it front loading. Mm -hmm. It's the early supply of cash um, to financial agents um, just to ensure that banknotes, euro banknotes and coins are distributed smoothly. So we cannot afford to deliver all what we've been talking about on one day. So we ensure that with front loading, um, we can distribute it smoothly over a longer period of time, which helps us from a logistical perspective. So for example, to be ready for 1st of January and to ensure people could withdraw banknotes in their ATMs, we could already have cash dispensers being filled up with euro banknotes before that date. And banks could also pass on some euros to retailers to make sure that the shops were ready on 1st of January. And this cash front loading, as we call it, began already last October. So this gave a little bit of a head time. Mm -hmm. So October 2022. October 2022, that's right. And um, banks, so banks were able to front load, but also retailers, enterprises were also able to front load. And this is another term, we call it sub front loading, <laughs> which means also retailers, when 1st of January comes, have euros available and are able to supply consumers with, with the new currency. So that, that was the second sort of pillar to make sure that, the, that we were ready for 1st of Jan. And in addition, we need to mention that in December, we started distributing starter kits of euro coins. And uh, starter kits um, are little bags where you already have some coins available. And these were distributed to citizens and businesses um, so that they would already start getting used to the new currency. They could not use it, but at least they could have it available ahead of time. Something I didn't know actually about Croatia was that they already accepted or some shops and restaurants already accepted the euro prior to the 1st of January. So for tourists, um, I didn't know that I've been to Croatia, but I, I used Kuna, but that's interesting. So it's not it's not a completely new currency for them in that respect. 
Um, I want to go back to these starter kits because it's also something that we've talked about on the podcast before about other changeovers. What exactly is inside it? There are two versions of the starter kit. It um, depends a little bit on the consumer on the other side. So you have one for citizens and one for businesses. For citizens, it's a little bag with uh, 33 coins in it of different value and denomination. And it's worth a little bit over 13 euros. And for businesses, since they have a, a higher turnover, it's a bag that is a little bit bigger, 500 coins more or less in it with different values also and worth close to 150 euros. And the idea of these starter kits is that they basically equip people with coins um, to do everyday shopping, which means the shops don't need to have so many coins on day one to be able to also provide change. And with this, we facilitate the logistics around the cash changeover. Otherwise, the shops and, and restaurants and things, they'd have to hold a lot of cash, which is not what we generally want, right? Um, That's it. These starter kits, they don't get them for free, right? I mean, they have to buy them. You said it's just over 13 euros for citizens. Okay, so they buy them and that's what they get in, in, in return. Okay. Now, we've talked a lot about the logistics, but I want to turn to the people actually using the money because that's a huge part of any cash changeover and it's really crucial to making it a success that, that people understand what's what's required of them, essentially. It's a massive mental change. I mean, you have to get used to, to thinking in euros. And I know that some countries gave out little calculators so that people could get used to converting their previous currency to euros. How was it in Croatia? So in Croatia, they introduced dual pricing in September. Um, this means they show prices for goods both in kuna and in euros. Mm -hmm. um, so people could start getting used to the conversion. It helps seeing, although at the beginning, I guess before 1st of January, you most probably stick to the kuna line, but uh, you at least start seeing what it means in euros. And this will stay until end December 2023. So there's still one year to go um, whereby citizens are just able without needing the calculator mm -hmm. um, to check that the price is equivalent. Okay, so they've been seeing the prices in euros and kuna for quite a while and they will keep seeing them uh, f until the end of 2023. How has people's use of money been affected? I mean, like on a daily basis, what, what have they had to change when paying with cash? So the Croatian government and the central bank have done everything to make the changeover as smooth as possible. So starting from the day of the introduction of the euro, there have there has been a two week period of dual circulation. So you could basically either use kuna or euro. Um, and this being said, businesses were encouraged to give you the change in euros so as to force you to slowly transition. <laughs> but you could use kunas um, where you, there was no other option. Um, so this was a gradual transition to facilitate that people get used to the new currency. This meant also that they didn't need to rush um, to get their euros all in one go, but that we could also facilitate and extend it over time and that the exchange took place in a longer term period. As of 15 January, the euro became the sole legal tender. So these means as of then you could only pay um, for goods and services in euros and not kunas anymore. Okay and we're talking after the 15th of January so what if not everyone managed to change their kuna into euros by the 15th of January what can they do? So there's, there's still quite a bit of time um, <laughs> to exchange kunas. The first deadline is one year from the changeover so 31st December 2023 uh, until then, banknotes and coins can be exchanged free of charge at banks, also post offices and at the country's financial agency. So you have a number of options. The only small caveat is there's a maximum per transaction, so up to a maximum of 100 banknotes or 100 coins. But you basically have quite a number of options available in the course of this first year. Mm -hmm. After that, so once if one year is over, the Croatian National Bank takes over. So you would basically then have one place for exchange. And there you have three years to exchange your coins. Three years to exchange your coins at the central bank. So this means until 31st December 2025. However, there is no deadline for banknotes. So banknotes, ah. you could basically keep on holding to them, um, not three years, but also five, 10, or even 15. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if you're interested in still keeping a little bit of a memory of what kunas looked like. <laughs> yeah. 
Most cash is generally exchanged within the first weeks after a changeover. Um, we are aware that people like to keep the old currency just for memory purposes. So we don't expect all banknotes to come back. Um, but as I said, the vast majority does come back in the first weeks after, after changeover date. You know, I mentioned earlier that I've been to Croatia and I do actually have some Kunar banknotes at home. So does it mean that I have to go back to Croatia, which is, of course, not a bad thing. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if I want to exchange those banknotes into euros, do I need to go to Croatia? So we also offer options outside Croatia, so okay. there is no need for you to fly <laughs> back. Um, we have the other national central banks, so national central banks in the euro area, who also offer exchange of banknotes free of charge and at a fixed conversion exchange rate, so sem- same conditions. And you, you could basically go to your national central bank um, starting 1st of January until 28 February, so you would need to do it in the course of the next weeks. Um, and there you can basically exchange um, up to 8,000 kuna per day or per person and day. So there's still an option um, before the end of February. Okay, well, I don't have that much, uh, but uh, I'll be putting a trip to the German Central Bank here in Frankfurt on my to-do list (laughs) then. (laughs) Okay, well, that was it for the cash, uh, what happened then for the cash changeover. And I understand as well that that money in banks, so things like savings and, and deposits, uh, the securities, bonds, all of that kind of stuff, the changeover for that happened simultaneously across all banks. So there wasn't really a preparation stage as there was for cash. In fact, Croatians were encouraged to deposit as much cash as possible into their accounts before the changeover because, uh, and it makes sense, but this is basically the, the easiest way to change their money into euros. Now, before we wrap up our conversation, we always ask our guests for a hot tip linked to the topic we're discussing today. Do you have a hot tip, something for our listeners? I would encourage uh, people to check the design of the new Croatian coins. Um, As we mentioned, they have a national specificity on the one side. So uh, there is the one euro coin that I think is particularly interesting where there is a Martin on the on the other side. This is like a little animal, a little bit like a weasel, I think. Uh, I know it in Germany because it's famous for biting into car wires, I think. <laughs> That's it. So a small mammal, basically, um, yeah. that uh, that is actually called Kuna in Croatian. Ah. So it gives uh, the name to the former former currency. And not only that, but it was also used or, or it was also pictured on the, the Kuna coins, one, two and five Kunas until now. And it was not only on the Kuna coins, but actually its uh, pelt was used as a form of payment in the Middle Age. So when ah. people starting started the uh, transactioning, basically the Martin was uh, the reference. It has also been on former coins, so not, not only on the recent ones. And there are other interesting facts also about the other Croatian national designs. So I would just encourage people to check them and also to look for the coins when paying, see if they, ha- if they get any of them when getting change from their shops. We have a whole section on our website, so we'll drop a link to that in the show notes so that people can go and have a look there. Well, Patricia, thank you so much for breaking down just how a currency changeover works. Super interesting. Thank you, Katie. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank Patricia Roa Tejero, head of our currency issue and circulation team here at the ECB, for joining the conversation today. Check out the show notes for additional material on this topic and a list of colleagues who contributed to this episode. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.